The Low Post is brought to you by Goodyear, helping you discover the road ahead. Goodyear, more driven. And now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post podcast early on a Thursday morning where I was very uh, excited to improve my mental health by gradually siphoning away my Philadelphia 76ers obsession. <laughs> I was ready to leave them in the rear view as just a, you know, 45 win, boring Eastern Conference also ran. Clearly it wasn't going to work. They had just missed the they had missed the mark with the team they had built. My excitement had proven unfounded. They would just lose in the first round. One of the stars would be traded. I would just leave them behind. My brain could focus on more productive things like parenting or whatever sorts of things people who are normal focus on. And then, bam! They hire a bunch of powerful executives underneath Elton Brand, retooling around Elton Brand, and then, bam! They hire Doc Rivers, and then, bam! <laughs> they hire Daryl Morey above everything else, and it's like, I just can't shake this crazy team. They're like the pink starburst of NBA teams. I can't shake them. I can't get away from them. They're just going to be part of an addiction for me for my entire life. And so today I'm very pleased to bring on, uh, in the wake of all this news, someone who's even more unhealthily obsessed with them than I am, so <laughs> much true. so that he wrote an entire book about them called Tanking to the Top, which is outstanding. Your own Weitzman, how are you? I'm good, Zach. I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Do you feel validated this morning? Like the, your <laughs> obsession that the problem, really, that the problem you have as a human being has, has been validated. Like all of your, all it, it's, it, you should have this obsession, I guess. I agree. And I think the part you left out, and it, it's it's a uh, smaller thing, but not only they hired Daryl Moore, but I love in the same day, the Sixers managed to find the one assistant coach who's on video saying Joel Embiid's annoying and gets away with a lot of stuff. And that guy comes into the team too. I just, like to me, that's just as Sixers-y as the Daryl Moore thing. I just, this team, yeah. It's is that Cassell? I don't know that Oh, Dan Burke. Dan Burke is on video last year. Um, talking about how Joel Embiid gets away with a lot of nonsense and it bothers him and it's annoying. I forget the exact quote. And that video made it into the uh, rights to Ricky Sanchez fan stream, whatever you want to call it. Um, they are very aware of it. I believe they booed Dan Burke last year at a game. Um, Embiid tweeted about this yesterday. Yeah, so even, even assistant coaching news in Sixers land is uh, something. Well, it's amazing what happens when um, you join – the team of a player who annoys you or that player joins your team or you're a fan and a player that you hated joins your team. Suddenly, everything that annoyed you about that player <laughs> becomes something that you love. Um, so so I, we both spent – I mean I wanted to podcast about this yesterday, but I wanted to take some time to make some phone calls not only to people in Philly but people around the league about what do you think Daryl's going to do with this team. Give me some good trades, whatever. We've both done that. I want to start with the simplest thing because the Sixers just can't do anything normally. They just can't. Okay, so like you're supposed to hire the top guy and then the top guy hires everybody else. And they did literally the exact opposite. Like not unprecedented. This is like the Kings are specialists at doing things this way. Um, what have you heard about sort of when Daryl became in play for them? Obviously, there was. it's known that they sort of lusted after Daryl a couple of years ago. So this ownership group's interest in him, you know, they hired his protege. Sam Hinkie years ago to start the process, which is all of this is poetic on a number of levels. But what have you heard about how they arrived at this point and how it has gone over maybe within the organization? Um, those are good questions, right? So uh, I, personally, I was a bit surprised. And I, I think I wonder if you had the same reaction. I know like the Daryl to Sixers dots are always out there, like you said, because he met with them. I'm going to say two seasons ago. I forget the years, whatever, right? It was before the 2018 season. I like I believe. to think they met like in a parking garage <laughs> at LaGuardia Airport or something. Like it was cloak and dagger, exactly. but I don't know where they, they probably just had dinner somewhere. <laughs> the six days seem to be big on uh, taking out to dinner, right? That seems to be the owner's moves, taking guys out to dinners. Um, so they do that, and then the dots are obviously all connected, and people kind of have a feeling Daryl might be out in Houston. But then Elton gives that press conference where he's talking very much like I'm the man in charge. And then they hire Doc Rivers. And all the while, Elton's conducting interviews for 
not only assistant GM types, but he's talking to people who are going to be, I can use a name, right? One name I can, Milt Newton, who's an assistant GM with uh, well, Milwaukee now, right? He talks to the, he, he ends up talking to Elton and the Sixers. So you don't do a lateral move. So if you do that, you're going to be a GM, which means Elton would be promoted, quote unquote, whatever that means, right? So these aren't, and they're talking to other people who would require a, uh, a GM title, right? To come to the Sixers to work under Elton. So if that's happening, I figured that the, and I think a lot of people figured that Daryl's ship had sort of sailed. The way it's been explained to me from inside, this is the company line, I guess I would say, is that um, Daryl became available and we're gonna kind of the, we're gonna zag, right? <laughs> the market and efficiency during a pandemic is we're gonna spend money, right? We did that with Doc, Doc became available. Let's go get him, spend money, get him. Daryl becomes available, talent, it doesn't matter. Let's go get him, everyone else is cutting, we're gonna spend. Um, I bet you had some similar conversations with people around the league who say that's BS. This was in the works for a while. You don't give up a job. You don't leave a job if you're Maury with um, without knowing what your next move is. I don't know that to be so. Um, I don't know that to be so either. Yeah. I, I do know that Daryl being out in Houston was um, as much as the news sent shockwaves. There were certainly rumblings that even as early as the bubble that that could be the last stand for Daryl. And it's been reported that, um, you know, in the coaching interviews with the Rockets, that the candidates were told, right. or at least that Daryl was pretty open with them, that at least there was a possibility he would not be there. Right. So that's, so it's kind of like the questions. So the company line, the move is everyone's saying that this happened quickly after Daryl came and Elton sort of got on board. And because, again, you go for a guy like Daryl. That's my, I'm curious to hear what you've learned. Um, I, as someone who's a bit of a cynic, I don't know. I, it's confusing. I don't know how to reconcile the two ideas that you're doing all these other things, right? And you're hiring all these other people and talking to other people. And at the same time, are you like working with Daryl on the back? Or, I don't know. It's a little confusing. That's Well, just think about it from Peter Dinwiddie's standpoint. Peter right. Dinwiddie is a well-regarded executive from the Pacers. If he wanted, maybe he got a pay raise. I don't know. He probably did because he thought he was getting a job title bump. If he wanted to be the third most powerful voice in the room, he could have just stayed in Indiana and been Correct. the third most powerful voice Correct. in the room. One suspects, and I have not talked to Peter Dinwiddie. I actually don't know him at all that he took this job to be the second most powerful voice in the room, or maybe 1B. And now there's a very large, powerful voice um, mm -hmm. uh, coming in above both of them. And I, I, you're right that you know um, people who would have required the GM title to come to Philadelphia and work under Elton meant that Elton would have been the president of basketball operations, which I wish that had happened because now we would have had to imagine what <laughs> title yeah, do you was. create in the continued construction of fake titles, like uh, King, Chess Master? Like, what is the title that puts you above president of basketball operations? I don't know. Emperor <laughs> Emperor of basketball operations. I don't know what it would be. I wish we had gotten to that point. Someone asked Sam Presti to get on that one. Um, Sam Presti still <laughs> quietly interviewing for the next coach of the Oklahoma <laughs> City Thunder. The last, the last job open. And a very exciting. We can we'll, uh, the Thunder are going to come up later in this conversation um, for yes. for various reasons. Yeah, I don't. You know, I don't know. I again, I don't. It's hard to know what to believe, right? But I've heard the same sort of party line. Not part, it's not even a party line, but just the same. You know, we've always been interested in Daryl. We didn't know for sure that he was going to become available, so we moved in these directions X, Y, and Z. When he became available, we thought, why not jump on it? It's Daryl Morey. Um, he fits the mindset that we've had since we bought the team uh, or since we came in power with the team. And, you know, obviously the connections with Hinky and all of that are, are well established. And we think that he and Doc, because they work together, even dating to Boston, uh, will have a good working relationship. And let's 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 do it. Let's you know, let's not waste time because, you know, as young as the Sixers feel, they actually don't have that much. I mean, everyone has time, but, you know, like Joel is in his mid 20s now. Ben is getting into his mid 20s. Um, you know, they have this team that is locked into this monstrous payroll that isn't good enough and didn't work. And again, every time we do this, I have to say, I picked the Sixers to win the East this year. So I cannot sit here and say, even though you and I talked about this the last time, I could certainly foresee and did talk about on this podcast all of the issues that undid them. I thought that they would have other pluses that would mm -hmm. compensate for a lot of those issues that did not bear fruit and and I will cop to that because some some people who really like this team are now bashing them and will not cop to the fact that they really like this team in the preseason. That's neither here nor there. Um but there isn't a lot of 
like Daryl can be patient. He can he can um, see what the team is if he wants to, but I I don't I don't necessarily think that he should or has to be patient. Um, and we could talk about what that means because you know the expectations are still high. They have these two young stars. They have an ownership group that you know very well more than I do. That is hungry, hungry to win. They want to be the bells of the ball. The six are the Sixers number four in Philadelphia sports. Is that still fair to say? Have they have they eclipsed the Flyers or that like the <laughs> Phillies? I don't even know. That's a. Uh, I'm going to defer the six. I'm not going to judge Philadelphia sports. I'm a New Yorker, so I can't say that. Um, but no, but they're definitely hungry, right? They're definitely hungry to win, and they definitely want to win. And they and I'm convinced that's. They're in this for the. They're very big on the sports business, right? They're in this to make money, a hundred percent. But they want. But the idea of winning and like, I don't think Josh Harris enjoys um, people mocking his ability to run a basketball team, right? I mean, I don't think anyone would enjoy that. I think part of the fun of owning a basketball team is to everyone think you're awesome. Um, and I don't think it's, he's really enjoyed this part where he's become a butt of a joke. So I'm with you, and that goes back to you know we're gonna chase big down Daryl's in the market. Let's go get him. He can solve. He can be can be our answer. So. Let's talk about where he might start, because as soon as this news broke yesterday, there was a lot of, um, well, Daryl wants to shoot threes. The Sixers have someone who refuses to shoot long twos, let alone threes, uh, short twos, mid-range twos, anything but a layup. Um, They were, as a team, they had an absolute, I don't even know what the right word for the shot distribution is. They had 33% of their shots were threes. Okay, that was 21st in the league. That's a very low amount of threes. 33.8% of their shots were mid-range jumpers. That was the fifth highest in the league. And the remaining 32 point whatever percent of their shots were at the rim. That was 24th in the league. They have the perfect one-third, one-third, one-third. Is that a Pythagorean? (laughs) Was that a Pythagoras? I don't even know what it is. It's like a three, four, five triangle. It's like a Pythagorean. I don't know. It's perfect. Um, And I don't think that Daryl wants to shoot a gazillion threes as much as he doesn't want to shoot a gazillion mid-range jumpers. And so I would not necessarily read into this that, um, well, Ben's Ben's got to go or Joel because he's a post-up player has to go. And we could talk about Daryl's history with Yao in Houston. Um, but he does not want to shoot. He does not want to be fifth in mid-range frequency. That's what he doesn't want to be. So, and he doesn't want to be that and twenty-second in free throw rate. Okay, so like all these other indicators are the problem. It's not necessarily. Yeah, I think he'd like to shoot more threes, but he doesn't want to necessarily play um, like the Rockets played uh, in in like strict stylistic terms. But he will want to change um, a lot of those things. And at bottom. Daryl has always been about superstars, like maybe to the detriment of chemistry and fit. Like, I don't care who, who's, who's available. Bosh, Butler, Rondo, Dwight, Carmelo. Who's the top 20 player who's available? Just get me that guy and the talent. CP, Russ, like, just get me that guy and I'll figure it out. Well, these guys are flawed as the fit may be. Ben Simmons just made third team All NBA. Would he? Did he deserve it? May, I voted for him. Would I have voted for him post bubble? I probably would not have. Devin Booker, somebody would have taken that spot. Um, but Joel Embiid is Joel Embiid. Like these guys are stars. Period. Yeah, it's. I don't expect him to trade. Yeah, I know. Like there's you know a lot of on Twitter and you see stuff like Embiid and Simmons trades. I and I don't expect him to trade either of those. But I think what you said is you'll be. I think the patience will come in regards to how he evaluates those two. Um, I think the, everyone else is going to be, you know, not even on the margin. Just, I think he'll, that's, he'll be pushing on these other guys, whether Tobias Harris, Al Horford, Josh Richardson. One of the phrases I heard um, from people inside Sixers, you know, deal maker. He's a deal maker. And I've seen this phrase pop up in other places, other reports as well, which makes me think that, you know, that's, again, one of the things that's being pushed as why we want him. And it does bring – it does make you think that, okay, this is the guy. They, they might think that we have an issue here. Our roster is a bit clogged. Um, what's one of the, besides Daryl's other skills, but one of his best skills is being able to, you know, work the phones and make these trades. What's one of the best ways to unclog our roster is to bring in Daryl and see what he can get for Al Horford for maybe Tobias Harris. So that's a little different. Um, Josh Richardson, guys like that. So I agree with you. And I think the answer would be, you know, build around those two stars and see what you can get for the other guys. Something also, somebody else mentioned to me, someone from another team is what they're interested in. 
seeing is, you know, Daryl's always been big on what, what's the quote? If you're a five percent chance, go ninety five percent, whatever that quote is. Um, if you have a five percent chance to win the title, right, you have to go all in. That seems like a low bar, and it's not. Like the Sixers right now do not have a five percent chance to win the title next season. I would be, I, I you know, I know five thirty eight was really high on them, uh, and that made me feel emboldened all year that five thirty eight <laughs> was high on them. I think after what happened in the playoffs, I would, it, it, look right now. Right, this, the roster is not going to be the same next year, but right now. I would be very, very surprised if this team had a 5% chance to win the title. So I'm interested in other people told me, like other teams, they're interested in seeing how aggressive he is in terms of attaching picks to guys and making trades. So like the Jimmy Butler thing in Houston, what was it, four first-round picks he was reportedly willing to give up to get Jimmy Butler? Um, it's been clear throughout his career that he's willing to part with first-round picks if he thinks he has a chance for a title. And that might be a tell. So if we start kind of, you know, see what's happening and how he starts chopping guys, a tell might be, is he willing to attach, you know, a first or two or whatever to get off of these guys and make trades? That might be a tell in terms of how close he thinks they actually are to winning a championship. I would be surprised if rumblings to that, deg- to that effect do not start happening mm-hmm. very soon. The draft is November 18th. The Sixers have five picks in the draft. Uh, number 21 in the first round and 34 and 36 in the second round and then two lows I think 49 and 58 34 and 36 are good picks I mean like those picks have value Um, people are interested to see how the draft unfolds this year in a pandemic where a lot of teams are losing money like will some teams sell draft picks Um, I don't think we'll see a first round pick sold that which that that would you, the fallout from that is so negative with your fan base. But I do think we'll see teams at the bottom of the first round try to trade for future first rounders to get out of the obligation now, but not sell, sell. Second rounders, though, sell. But I think the Sixers have some ammo to get off of the guys that you mentioned. And I still think, like Josh Richardson to me, I like Josh Richardson. I, I know it didn't work last year. He has $10.8 million next year and a player option for 11 6 in the following year, which could be an interesting player option for him depending on how he plays. Like, I still think he's a helpful player. I've had a couple of GMs on other teams just this morning ask me, hey, I don't necessarily want to talk about Tobias and Al with you. Like, what have you heard about Josh Richardson? I think he's, he's, he's I think, still at worst a neutral trade asset. And for the right team, I think he's a, a, a plus that acts like a second-round pick if you attach him to Al Horford if there's the right match. But I, I think these... I think those five picks, they're pretty much pick neutral still going forward. Like they, even though they've traded a lot of stuff there, they've been wheeling and dealing themselves in Philly. They have picks to play with. And I, I think we will see them try to get off. Sounds bad. Um, like get off those guys, but get off those guys and try to flip them for, you know, other players that are in similar situations with their teams, but just fit better in Philadelphia. Well, that's the key, right? So it's not, right, get off, even for these guys, it's probably not the right term, right? Because if you, let's say you found somebody to take Tobias Harris, let's say, I don't know, let's say the Knicks just absorbed him, okay? This is an example, right? Don't do it. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> but the point being, um, you're not getting cap room, right? You're just getting off a salary. So your team's becoming worse. That's why it's so hard to trade these guys. Like you're not, you're not creating cap the room. The Sixers are not creating Correct. cap room. Correct, and it can't do anything this getting someone to take a Tobias Harris doesn't help the Sixers. It makes them worse on the court, and it's not giving you any really roster flexibility to do much to improve your roster. So that's where the trades become kind of interesting. Can I ask you a Daryl question? I'm, I'm curious your opinion on something. Yes. On your podcast, but I want to ask you a question. Um, so my read on Daryl has always been, and covering him from afar, has always been that his strength sort of as a president of basketball operations or GM, whatever, is the... Um, you know, wheeling and dealing, talent evaluation, finding the bad Macklemore types or working the phones, finding guys like that. Um, and not necessarily the same. Maybe I'm wrong, so I'm curious. And not necessarily the same as like when you think of guys like, I don't know, let's say Masai Uji or Sam Presti, where obviously talent evaluation is the number one um, skill of theirs or a primary skill. But they're also, it's about kind of instilling, I don't know, an ethos or a culture, not, not a hokey way, but just in terms of an organization, building an organization. And the Rockets have always seemed different. And for me, as someone who's covered the Sixers, I've always thought the answer to their issues would be more of the, you know, I'll say the other type, someone whose skills are more of fixing an organization from the top down, as opposed to just figuring out, hey, this guy fits well with this team. Um, 
And it seems, I'm not saying this can't work, I'm, I guess I feel like this is going to be an interesting test case in terms of what's actually most important. There are some people close to Sixers when I floated, them to them, floated this to them yesterday, and they're like, no, the idea is we need somebody who can help improve our roster, and that's all that matters. But I'm curious from your perspective, is, and that's not that I think the Daryl move is a, I think it's really good and it's going to help the Sixers, but I guess I'm curious your reaction to it or what you're expecting or what your initial thoughts were when you heard about this. That's really interesting because I, I do think culture – in on-court talent are intertwined. They're not separate. They're not separate. Like people think of culture as do, do guys go out to dinner? How's the right. locker room? I, to me, those things are not separate. They're intertwined to some degree. Like in Houston, James Harden is the culture. Like that's it. That's the whole culture. And that bleeds into how they play on the floor. The whole team is about him. And I don't mean this in a bad way. I'm just saying the way he wants to play is how they play. Everything that they have done is to maximize his comfort and his style of play. And it has become so extreme that I think it has it has affected the culture of the team. And, and stylistically, they've almost gotten out of whack. As great as their offense is in a regular season, it has not translated to the same level in the playoffs. And I think we've seen, and I don't put this all on James, and I don't put it all on Daryl. And I've said, like, it's impossible. I'm excited to see Daryl in a new place because mm-hmm. it became impossible to separate Daryl Morey and James Harden in Houston because they built the team almost together and they built it around James. Um, but playing with James, like, appears to have a shelf life. Like, guys go there and then they have to leave after two years for whatever reason. Like, why did Chris Paul leave? We can debate that if you want. Will Russ last more than a couple years there? I don't know. Uh, Dwight, why did he leave? We can debate that. Certainly Dwight has not been like, people have not been clamoring to have Dwight Howard on their team until this year. Um, But I think like, you know, (laughs) both Van Gundys have come on my podcast, which is interesting because one of them almost got the Rockets job and talked about how James has to move off the ball and James has to, to, you know, he can't become a statue when he gives up the ball and and it hurts their offense. It's like, well, why can't he do that? Like, that's like, like, if every coach realizes this, if every moron like me realizes, mm-hmm. like, why, why doesn't it happen? And, you know, to me in Philly, I, I think that was a this all of this was a large part of the reason why Doc Rivers appealed to them, why they dropped everything the moment that Doc Rivers got there, because Doc Rivers will um, get into he's not afraid to get into Joel Embiid's face or Ben Simmons face and say, this is how we have to do this. This is how we have to do that. You're not doing this well enough. But I, I, you know, it is interesting because, you know, we talk about culture and got to have a culture and, you know, blah, blah. It's like, well, there's no culture that's going to fight the Warriors with four stars. It doesn't right. matter. Like, it, like, those guys can all hate each other. They're going to win. So it's it's hard. It, it's a hard brew to figure out because I think Daryl is right that we kind of fetishize this stuff and, and turn it into more than it is when you either have talent or you don't. But I do think... All of it does mix together, and when you get to the absolute highest level, it all kind of matters. So I, th- I don't know how they're going to sort it out, but I am interested. And I think Doc was part of that, right? I think Doc, I think it's all, to, it's all part of the mix. No, it makes sense. It's going to be an interesting test case, and I, the Doc part, right? I would, and I know that's what they're going to sell it as, right? That he's the guy, like that they, that partner, that partnership can be really fruitful together if things work out. Fruitful, fruitful. What did Sam Hinkie once tell me? We've planted the seeds in the apple orchard, but I want to have the whole orchard or something. I can't remember. There was a fruit. Fruit is a is a through. You can do a through line of fruit metaphors from the beginning That's of the great. process until now with a fruitful partnership. So let's talk about um, some fake trades, uh, if you want, because I do agree with I do agree with you that Daryl's first move is going to be. Let me see if I can tweak the surrounding pieces. That said, before we get into this, if they don't play, if they fail again next season, uh, yeah, I don't think the time. If, if, I don't think the time is going to be long before, if they're failing, before Daryl starts to think bigger. And I don't know what that looks like right now. We can talk about that later, but I don't think like I. I would even, and again, there's no reporting behind this. Let me make this clear. But if they're not succeeding at the trade deadline, like I don't even, I wouldn't even be shocked if you start to hear some stuff at the trade deadline next season. I don't even think you necessarily have to. And again, no reporting behind this, just my speculation based on whatever. Um, I don't think you just give it a year if it's clear halfway through the year that it isn't working. But let's talk about some fake trades. 
Um, let's start here. Who do you think is easier to move, Al Horford or Tobias Harris? Um, <laughs> the, uh, the the first one. We'll just say that. The, uh, Al Horford. Would say. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that Al Horford, who's X years older than Tobias Harris, and um, I, let's say less in possession of a critical skill set, three-point shooting, than Tobias Harris. If you surveyed a bunch of GMs, and I did last night, I didn't survey all 30. I didn't survey it for whether it was GMs, president of basketball operations, or emperors of basketball. I didn't get all of them. <laughs> but it was almost unanimous that Al is easier to move. And I, the only reason why is his contract is effectively a year and a half shorter because Tobias is making $39 million in 2024. Al's contract expires in 2023, and it's only 14 million guaranteed out of 26 million. So it's effectively a year and 53 million dollars um, cheaper. And I do think there's a sense around the league that Al is much better than he looked last year in a funky role, and that if we just made him, we theoretical Al Horford team, just made him our starting center. Well, he defends still at a decent level. He's a good passer. He's a great locker room guy. Again, two years and a half. Like if you if you want to wave him in that last year, fourteen million, you can stretch that out. It's not like cripplingly awful to your team. Like that's it. He seems like the the number of sweeteners Philly has to put in, I think, is less than with with Tobias Harris, who's still only in his late twenties. I mean, it's not like he's old, right? It's weird. Also, and you, I think you spoke about it on recent podcasts. Um, there might be more of a desire. Some teams maybe need a big now, especially in the West, um, which helps Horford Horf will fit in there. Um, yeah, Tobias thing is, and I hate talking because like he's a really good guy and a really he's good. He's a good basketball player. He's a good player. It's, it's high, but just that contract is just. Um, I, I do, <laughs> I do like the idea of trying to picture as the sick. Let's say Daryl's in the office trying to talk about how he wants to trade Tobias and he can't get anyone to bite. And you know what does Elton say? Like does Elton blame on Alex Rucker also again or something like that? Like how are they? How do they talk about? I always love the idea of how these guys come into teams with contracts, bad contracts, or bad players on the team, and the guy who made the deal is still there, and they kind of talk about that. I always find that kind of a funny uh, visual. So give me a good Al Horford trade if you got one. I can, or uh, I can start. Whatever you want. You can. I can. A good one. Well, we can. Let's go. We can go synergy. How should we do a synergy? You know, I'm a I'm a Sixers author, so we can go synergy. Um, Sam Hinkie comes in. First move he makes is trading Drew Holiday. So what about if we reverse it and Sam Hinkie's former boss comes in and Al Horford and something for Drew Holiday. Al Horford and a first for Drew Holiday. I don't know something along those lines. That was one I came up with. I didn't think of that one, your own. Two first, Al Horford and two first, maybe. Yeah, I, 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 I got to get paid a lot if I'm if I'm New Orleans. Um, Josh, Josh Richardson, throw Josh Richardson in there, maybe. I don't now know. You're just now you're getting nutty. Um, <laughs> I don't love the the fit with Zion. Uh, you know, I, let's. I, I the fit with Zion's okay. Um, it's okay. I don't. I don't think I love it enough if I'm New Orleans to really dive too deep into those waters, particularly with. You know, I can, whether with cap room or the mid-level, I can get a uh -huh. Derek Favors again. Like, I just don't feel the need. And I don't know what's going to happen with Drew Holiday um, trade-wise or extension-wise. But I just, I don't feel, like, I'm not winning the championship in the next two years anyway. So I'm not, and, and I think I can chase a playoff spot with what I have. So I don't necessarily feel the urgency to shake it up that much. By the way, with and the, you mentioned like you know the mid level, I think that's part of as we're saying that Horford's the easier player to move. Um, it also shows just how misguided that contract was. That right, you can get you know solid centers now for these five ten million dollar contracts. Man, the the big man market this summer is just loaded with dudes mm -hmm. who are mm -hmm. like, what's Tristan Thompson getting? Right. You know what's I mean? I mean I, you can go through the whole list. There's a there's a gazillion decent big guys who are all going to get squeezed. Um, you know, particularly if if any one of the guys who, a tier above, like if Serge Ibaka is really willing to take the mid level to go somewhere, like that's a slot that is gone for yep. for all these other guys. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, I'm going to give you one. Ready? Sure. Uh, let's pair Daryl again with um, one of his former lieutenants. Now, uh, this is Ma the obvious one, yes, <laughs> Monty McNair in Sacramento, and let's send Al Horford and some stuff. Now, I don't know how much stuff I got to send, but some stuff. For Buddy Heald. Or I could get real crazy and send Al Horford and Josh Richardson and less stuff, I guess, for Buddy Heald and Corey Joseph. 
or I could throw Harrison Barnes. I was going to say when mix. Barnes coming in, yeah. <laughs> um, but I think Buddy Heald is a guy that makes a lot of sense because clearly there's something fishy going on in Sacramento with his level of discontent. You know, Jason Jones of the Athletic reported he's not even returning. Luke Walton's text messages. Not they a great have, time usually. Huh? Not a great sign usually. Not a great sign. Yeah, I return almost everyone's text messages. There's almost no one who I hate enough to not return their text messages. Like, you know, even, yeah, I don't have any enemies, I don't think. <laughs> I think I, I'm trying to think, is there anyone whose text messages I don't return? I don't think so. Um, uh, and he is due, he is starting a four-year contract that runs through 2024, so a year longer than Al's contract. They have Bogdan Bogdanovich entering free agency. Um I just don't know that Sacramento wants to pay everybody. Like when Fox is is coming up for an extension now, Bagley is a year away from coming up for an extension. Whatever you think of him, he's going. He's the number two pick. If he has a good year this year, he's going to want a lot of money. Um, and the Kings, I think, are probably very very hungry to make the playoffs for the first time in nine thousand years, and probably think to themselves, "Well, what are we missing?" defense we need to improve our defense a little bit how can we do that well is you know you know Rashawn Holmes is all right as a center I don't think he's going to anchor an elite NBA defense particularly with the perimeter talent that we have and maybe Al can't do that either but am I ready to put Bagley at the five like I don't know if I can roll with that and think we're going to have a good enough defense so I start to be able to sell myself on Horford can come here as a stopgap for a couple years. If things go right, maybe we're the eighth seed. If we're the eighth seed, we'll throw a freaking parade if parades are ever allowed again. Um, and and I can, you know, again, I don't know the degree to which they have to sweeten that deal, but Philly does have to sweeten it. And Josh Richardson, I don't think is enough. I think there has to be a draft asset, at least one in there. But I like that one. That was on your list. I'm, I'm excited. That was, suspect. yeah. I like that one for Philly. Um, Buddy Hield, the shooting would be great. And the guard, and you can do maybe some stuff with Embiid that, you know, similar stuff they do with Reddick. Um, well, and, so, and Embiid can cover, like, Buddy's not a good defensive player, but Embiid covers up a lot. And you have Simmons, right? Like, you, if you're a Philly, you can take a you can take flyers on offense guys um, or poor defensive players. Um, to me, it's a question of, I guess it's how much sweetening or <laughs> how much um, leverage is Daryl doing over his former um, understudy, you know, just all of that. Just what Sacramento bite? That's my whole question on that one. I love, I love mentor-protege. <laughs> Trades. trades. I, the apex of that is Presti and Hennigan in the uh, Oladipo for Ibaka. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Oladipo and the pick that became Sabonis for Ibaka. Um, I like that one though. I don't. And, and you know that's a that would be a blow for some of the cap space teams because it would mean that Sacramento is just going to re-sign Bogdanovich, who is mm-hmm. coveted. You know, by almost I'm not all the cap space teams. I don't think, but uh, several of them, a few of them for sure. Um, so I like that one. Did you? So that was on your list. What that else was on my on, list. What uh, else this, is on your list? I kind of like that. I'm curious your thoughts. Um, we'll say Horford and maybe sign something. You know, again to use your word, stuff for uh, Terry Rozier to Charlotte. That's the next one on my list. Yeah. Um, you know, Terry Rozier quietly shot. In the high 30s, I think from three last year, maybe I even. Was, I think it was. I looked this up. I think it was 40.7. I was gonna say he might have. He might have cracked 40. Um, he's on a. He's on a contract that I don't. I don't love that runs for I think three more seasons. Uh, let me look that up now. Um, but that's another one where it's like. Um, that's an obvious sort of like. Stopgap. Like they don't have a center. Um, I mean, they have centers that are okay. Like they, they have Cody Zeller, who's all right. I think they've sort of, he's always injured. I don't know. I, I think, you know, that the Zeller ship is sailing off into the sunset somewhere there. Um, can we, you know, can we make the, the playoffs in the East, which is better next year, but still, I think, vulnerable at the eighth spot, seventh spot, whatever. Not as vulnerable as people think, but still vulnerable. Um, can we have a feel-good season? If, if we have this guy who's going to help stabilize our defense, be a good locker room guy. And I think the, the other thing we should talk about is, you know, Al signed with the Sixers to chase a championship. He's in the twilight of his career. Um, I think he every second he's in the league, he wants to feel like he has a chance to win the championship. And I think that's an issue that some of these teams will, Sacramento, Charlotte, I, I, I wonder if Al's representation will butt into some of these trade talks. And I don't mean that in a bad way and say, hey, look, like this isn't, what we, signed, <laughs> this isn't what we signed up for. Like we want to go someplace where we can win, to which the Sixers and the Kings will say, well, what you also signed up for was a gigantic contract that that you're going to get and you don't necessarily get to dictate anymore. It's going to be a little thorny. But I like that one. I also started wondering, like, 
can Nick Batum do anything? Like, is, is there anything? Like, he, it's not like Nick Batum is 41 years old. Like, I don't understand yep. what happened. Um, he's on an expiring deal for $27 million and, and you know, did literally nothing almost for the Hornets last year. Um, you know, there's, there's some interesting... There's some interesting deals there. Two problems, though. Can I give you two problems with Charlotte? Sure. Number one, if I trade Rozier, I'm very dependent on Devontae Graham. Yes. And he was wonderful last year. Kind of hit the wall when when the rest of the league was like, all right, this guy's the number one option. Let's start treating him like one. Um, and he's small. And I worry about him being a little overwhelmed as my, like, like by far number one creator without another guy to sort of siphon a little bit of the load. Number two, uh, this is almost completely dependent on the draft because if Charlotte finds say, a way yeah. to get Wiseman, then I think they're out of all of this. And, and I do think all of the buzz, and I've talked about this frequently, about Charlotte trying to move up to number two or number one to get Wiseman. I think that buzz is real. I think they will be active trying to do that. And if they can do that, then I don't think they're in a rush to go get Al Horford. Do you think – I don't know enough about the uh, draft guys, but do you think that that buzz is because they like Wiseman as the best, as the best player or that they want a quote-unquote center, right? And that would be the difference. So if, and if therefore if you got Horford, would that then free you up to draft, oh, we like this guard X or Y, actually, we can draft this guy? That's a good, that's a good question. I don't know. I think yeah. they're desperate to get a big man, right. and they feel like – you know, we've been, they moved way up in the lottery. We've been given this chance. And, and, you know, if we can get him without, you know, if we can pay a small price to move up one spot or two spots, why not do it? So that was on my list too. Um, any other Horford places that you liked? Charlotte and Sacramento are the obvious ones. Those are, those are the, those are the two ones that really stand out. Yeah. So I got, <laughs> so the, I'll, I'll throw one. Let me quit on this different conversation. Um, the, I do wonder, you know, Rockets, if there's something there, if they decide they want a big man back, and I find that funny and just fun. So maybe Eric Gordon's uh, something there. Um, and then obviously there's the whole Thunder Chris Paul conversation, which is applies to Horford and Tobias or you know the whole Sixers thing. I think the Chris Paul, I think the Chris Paul thing is really interesting. And like you said, like I could see, I could see Tobias Harris in picks for Chris Paul. I could see Al Horford in picks for Chris Paul. And again, I don't know Al's appetite for that. I don't know the, the level of sweetener that is required for that. I don't know how Oklahoma, Oklahoma City is really smart, obviously. They have a floor for what they think they can get for Chris Paul. And part of that floor is what can we spin the next guy into? Like they're thinking three trades ahead. Right. Um, and so if they don't think they can spin Tobias Harris into anything of value, they're not going to do that trade because they'll have another trade that they feel is better for them, for Chris. Um, it, Al, you know, maybe, I, I don't know. Again, they're just going to have to think about it, but I think those are all in play. Houston's on my list, like P.J. Tucker, Eric Gordon, and it has to be some other stuff, and that that's the problem. I don't have a lot of other good ones. I really don't. No, it's hard. Um, yeah, oh, here, here's one other one actually I'll throw at you. How, it depends. This is if you got a little crazy, if you do – you know, depending on what happens in Rudy Gobert, but Conley is another name that I, someone else mentioned to me, and I thought so that would be you know if Utah this, this now we're doing like fantasy football basketball. Yeah, this stuff. one hurt. That one hurts my brain a little bit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which we're is remaking fine. entire roster. Um, okay, what about Tobias? Can we find any homes for Tobias? Good God, um, did you? <laughs> I mean, I, Chris Paul came up. Yeah, um, Chris Paul came up, but again, it's just a matter of. You know, I could see there's a universe where the Thunder are like, Tobias is a good culture guy. Like, he can give us kind of what Gallo gave us, you know, uh, like help our young guys space the floor. Um, but it's just a big contract. It's a big, big, long, long contract. And also, I mean, I guess you can never have too many picks, but at what point are getting extra first round picks tossed in? Like, is it not helpful? I mean, I guess it's always helpful, but they have so many right now, thanks to the Clippers and the Rocket. I mean, um, well, that's why there's all there's a, a lot of people have asked me would the Clippers try to go get Chris Paul because th there's all this buzz that they want a point guard. Kawhi needs a point guard, and you know I think um, our old friend Mark Stein reported on their interest in Rajon Rondo yesterday. And the Clippers have a lot of vehicles like they can use the sign and trade mechanisms to get you know to, to get a lot. They can get up to forty million dollars in outgoing salary pretty easily. Um, and then you start to think, well, what picks could they trade to Oklahoma City? You're like, oh no, the Thunder already 
like the Thunder have a timeshare already, like <laughs> exactly. in Steve exactly. Ballmer's house. They have all the picks. They just Literally. like you can't trade them anything. There's nothing else you can't. They're all unprotected too. You can't like well, we'll loosen the protect. No, they're already as loose as it gets. <laughs> it's done. Yeah, it's done. The um, then I was trying to see about the Hawks because I you know a team that has cap space and you know wants to win and just it's hard. And then you have future extensions to think about with Trey Young and I just I couldn't maybe you're. You know, you can be a better trade machine than me. No, uh, a number, out. a number of GMs, a number of front office guys. I shouldn't say necessarily GMs uh, recommended the Hawks to me last night. So the Hawk, what about the Hawks for Tobias? You know, they want to win, they really want to make the playoffs. I don't see it. I just doesn't feel like a Travis Schlenk player to me. Um, I think if and when they move to get a veteran in there. It will. They will really prioritize defense because they know they need a lot of defense around Trey Young, and I just don't. I don't. I don't see Tobias as a fit. And again, they'll. They're thinking two moves ahead, and I don't know what they can spin him into. But people suggested the Hawks. It's funny. Horford would be perfect for them if they didn't make that trade last. The Capella deal, right? You could. Th- you could see a uh, way where Horford would fit in there in terms of their desires. Um, other than that, I mean, it was you know you can go crazy, but yeah, I, I had no success with Tobias. How about? Tobias Harris for Kevin Love. See, so, okay, but this goes back to my – to me, you do that if you're doing something with Horford too, right? I guess these are all done in, con, in conjunction, right? Um, like it goes back to Tobias trade. So Tobias' contract is not great. He still fits better and is better alongside, in my opinion, a better alongside – or kind of works alongside Simmons and Embiid and more so than Horford. Um, so if I like if I was Maury in the Sixers, like the Horford thing would be my first step to see. Well, how that. about Horford for Kevin Love? I had that actually on my list. This kind of a, Horford's uh, deal is is the same length but less costly in that final year. And you can tell me that. Well, I mean, why do we keep trying to get big guys to the Sixers? Like Simmons is a power forward. Joel is a center. Tobias Harris is a power forward. I think Simmons is just a Simmons. Like I don't really care. You can like. I actually think he's better guarding perimeter guys. I mean, he can guard everybody, but he's, he can guard point guards. Like, I don't really care about his positional designation. It doesn't bother me. What I really need is a shooter. Yep. And Kevin Love likes to post up and, and get his jump hooks going. And he's good at it. He's a good passer from out of there. But as he gets old, he's also just embraced, like, I just let that fly. Like, I'll shoot 10 threes in a game. I'll spot up. I'll pick and pop. I, I just think stylistically – he makes more sense there than Horford does, and it's not close. And I, that's, you know, again, it just depends on what else is Cleveland looking for because, you know, I don't, Al Horford is not in their long term plans, that's for sure. It does feel like there are ways between Horford and Josh Richardson, it does feel like there are, you know, again, as we're saying, it's hard. It does feel like there are options for Maury and the Sixers here to kind of tweak where then maybe Tobias Harris. You know, you can focus more on him as a player as opposed to a contract, right? And he's he can, he can play with these guys. He can you can work with him, and it doesn't look so bad. Maybe the contract looks bad, but you're not saying, "Oh man, this roster is completely stuck." The un- the the question that's hard to answer is: Let's say they do something like this, one or two moves like this, they reshape the team, more shooting, more perimeter guys. You know, I, I agree with you. Buddy Heald would be a delightful fit for them, um, and and they lose in the first round again. Because by the way, the East is. You know, depending on what Toronto does, Boston, Toronto, Miami, Brooklyn, uh, Milwaukee, you know, Indiana is not going anywhere. I mean, I think they'll they'll try to make a couple moves this offseason. But, you know, it's not like a guarantee that Philly's – I mean, Philly was the sixth seed last year. Like, they're not a guarantee to do anything in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. If they if they disappoint again, the, the, the question is, well – and maybe it depends on how that disappointment unfolds. But who do you think they would look to trade first? <laughs> this is the question. Um, I, I phrase. J- I think Simmons. Um, not necessarily from a. Um, assuming both no players pushing it out. I'm not even saying from a player value standpoint. I'm saying Joel Embiid has um, allies certainly on ownership level and higher up. And um, Simmons is powerful, but I mean, I'll say Joel Embiid and Michael Rubin, who's a minority owner, who I believe his stake went up like ten percent recently. Um, they are legitimately close. That's a legit friendship and relationship. Um, it doesn't mean trades can happen after that, but just Embiid's level of power there seems to be, or Embiid's power um, seems to be at a level higher than Simmons is there. And this is all just playing out. We're playing it out too Correct. far because Correct. someone could get injured. You know what I mean? That's yeah, yeah. that's to me, that to me has always been the argument against, there's been this rush to trade Ben Simmons out of there on, on NBA Twitter and, and, you know, trade machine, you know, GMs. 
because oh, just shooting in Joel, shooting in Joel, shooting in Joel. Um, it's always been hard for me to bet the franchise on Joel because I just you know the the injury history scares me. Although he's been mostly you know that the the, the foot injuries and stuff haven't really manifested um, in a few years now, just scares me a little bit. Um, I did I did um, have a conversation with the GM maybe th- after Houston crapped the bed in the playoffs, and I said you know we were spitballing like if Houston wanted to trade Harden now, okay. Um, let's go through the, and, and, and priority number one was we got to get a young star because most of these guys, they get traded. They're not good enough anymore to get a young star and like a capital S star. Harden is okay. Like Harden is the guys are a walking top three MVP finisher every single season. Um, and so we started going through all the young stars in the league. Would they do it? Would they do it? Would they do it? Would Miami do it for Bam? Don't think so. Would Phoenix do it for Booker? Don't think so. Um, and, and on and on. And, you know, we started to think about, well, who's, who's realistic? And we landed in a couple. And this is just purely theoretical, <laughs> just a thought exercise. No reporting behind it, but the kind of thought exercise you go through when it's your job to do this. Um, and Simmons was one of the places we landed. And so I, I, I do think like, and then you get to thinking about like, well, Simmons doesn't fit with Westbrook. And if you're the Rockets, it's like, who the hell cares? Like, I'm the, if I'm training James Harden, the answer to that question is, I don't care. Like, I just like, I'll figure the other stuff out later. I'm getting Ben Simmons on my team. I don't think that deal is crazy. Again, like we got to go through about 15 steps before that even becomes a conversation. But I don't think that deal is crazy because we didn't like, we can go through more of the young stars. And I mean, stars like Houston would want a star. There aren't, it's, it's tough to thread the needle. And I mean, and what you're saying, like Simmons is I would say great, really, really, really good, right? Simmons is a really, really good player. He's a and, star. Yeah, and so the same way we say in Joel in shooting, um, again, Simmons part of it by his own limitations, but he also hasn't played with a roster perfectly built around his, you know, skill set in a way that maybe we'd maximize and see what he can do at the highest level. Um, he's like great. Tatum, like the Celtics aren't doing Tatum, right. for Simmons or, or Tatum for Harden rather. Right. That's that's not happening. Uh, I'm going through the standings, but keep going. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's it's so I, I if I mean if we're playing this out right, if you're another team and you build around Ben Simmons, you you're excited about that. Ben Simmons is great, you know, he, and it plays great defense, which I think, you know, not that you underrated. Just in theory, part. in theory, again, in theory, would the Nuggets do Jamal Murray for Ben? I, Simmons? I'm, I'm not even, no for James Harden. For James Harden. I'm not even sure they would after that playoff run. Like the Jazz aren't doing Donovan Mitchell, I don't think. Like to to those teams, you have to you have to put yourself in their shoes. Like those are homegrown guys. They know those guys. Both of those guys are coming off monstrous playoff performances. They're young. Like I just like there comes a point where like James Harden's better than both of them, right? It's not it's not really close. But there comes a point where it's like, is it worth the upheaval that that causes, even if in a vacuum? Right now at age 29, by the way, or 30 or whatever James is, he's quote unquote better. Like, I just don't, I don't, if I'm Utah, I'm like, it's not, like, it's not worth the upheaval. Like, it's, not, it's just not worth it. So you're saying kind of like if, if Houston, st- if Houston and Philly both sort of stall or worse in a way we some expect or could foresee, um, they could be the first phone calls for each other and the best, the best landing spots for each other. I just think that, that, I think that deal yeah. is not crazy. And yeah. I don't even want to get into Embiid deals because they're just it, it's we just go a little nuts. So, but I thought that this is a GM I really like, and I thought that was an interesting thought exercise. We were just going through the standings because if you trade a player of James Harden's caliber, and again, there's nothing to this. There's no reporting. The Rockets are not trading James Harden, but like given the contract situations and the direction of the team, I you know I don't think it's lunacy to start thinking about you know what they could get for him and we just went down the standings and we're like i don't know if they can get that like the first thing you ask for is a blue chip young straight up star and those are hard to get yeah no i uh, i agree that's um i mean the rumors are gonna be flying also with maury you know and Harden um all season anyway so they can't even they couldn't even i guess they could hug if they reunited if they both had tested negative under the NBA's <laughs> protocol, are we following? We could do follow baseball rules, you know. It could be a whole different thing. Uh, that is a whole. That is a whole pile of something. Uh, but but I don't really follow baseball. I do miss baseball. The tension of baseball is is is. Um, the NBA doesn't have things like that. The pauses, no. the time you get to think about each pitch. It's it's just so delicious. Have we not? Have we missed anything that you want to cover? I mean, I you know I, again I. I 
I think Daryl is he is a wheeler and dealer, but I think it's going to start with these supporting pieces. And stylistically, yeah, he wants to shoot more threes, but he also wants to shoot more rim shots and more free throws and, you know, play great defense. And, you know, I guess we'll see, right? Yeah, I'm curious. Um, the One thing we didn't touch on, we don't have to, is Elton's uh, role in all this and moving forward there um, in terms of his place there. And then also him, Doc, and if he stays him, Doc, and Daryl, that's still a lot of uh, big personalities and egos in a place. It'd be curious to see how, or interesting to see how that plays out. Sometimes, though, I, you know, Elton actually doesn't strike me as a big ego. Uh, I, I shouldn't mean, say I, ego. That's the wrong word. That's the wrong word. Just a prominent person who has a prominent a person. Yeah, yeah Elton. And, but Elton, I think Elton's good and smart and will figure it out. And I also think there's something like, yeah, the, you, you heard this a lot about the Clippers, right? Oh, the, too many big personalities there. Chris Paul, Blake Griffin, Doc Rivers, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes it matters where you are in your career, right? Like this might be the last stop for Doc. And, like, I don't know that Daryl is psyched to – he just had the GM job forever in Houston. Like, I don't think – I think Daryl wants – his ideal world is he wants to have this job for a long time. Like, if you – people come together, sort of like the the, the executive coach version of the, the 2008 Celtics. Like, if, if the players – if everyone comes together at the right times in their careers, like, maybe that stuff doesn't matter as much. Maybe you just make it work. Right. No, I mean, the other way to look at it is it's um – expertise and experience right depends how it plays out um you know but it's, I'll, I'll find it interesting it'll be interesting to follow uh the sixers just can't I, we can't shake the sixers <laughs> no i gotta write an afterward to the afterward i already wrote you know so did you yeah that's right you need a you need a you need a new a new chapter i guess we'll, we'll see what happens but um the last thing i will say is you know about joel is i, I wanted to just bring these numbers up because the post up is dead and you know, nobody wants to post up anymore. Well, here are Joel's numbers on post ups last year, according to tracking data on second spectrum. Um, points per possession for the Sixers 1.216 every time uh, Joel posted up. Uh, any any possession featuring a Joel Embiid post up, 1.2. That, that's the best offense in the NBA, basically. If you did that every if you average 1.2 points per possession, you'd be the best offense in the NBA. Out of 95 guys who posted up at least 100, uh, at least 100, at least 50 times, rather, 95 guys posted up at least 50 times, that was seventh. The guys ahead of him are Bogdan Bogdanovich, barely posted up, you know, more than 50 times. Taj Gibson, 55 post ups. LeBron, pretty good. Nemanja Bialica, sh- sneaky good. Jimmy Butler, Kelly Olynyk. I love that Kelly Olynyk just pops up on these random leaderboards. And then Embiid. Um, points per direct post up. That's like when he when the player involved shoots it or or passes to a player who shoots right away. One point one four three. That's also top ten. His turnovers reached a career low for him. He was actually pretty decent taking care of the ball. Middle of the pack in this group. Shooting fouls. Um, Shooting fouls, 15.5% of Joel Embiid's post-ups led to shooting fouls. That was the second most in the league behind Utah Bogdanovich, um, who was actually the first. I, I, I had the wrong Bogdanovich we were talking before. It's Utah Bogdanovich both times. Like, for all his flaws, and yeah, can he read double teams, which I think he got a little better at, like a Joel Embiid post-up, even in this mishmash of a roster, was still really good. Now, again... Is it as good against great defenses in the playoffs? I, I don't know, but like there, like last year, he was an absolute beast in the post, like more so than he'd been even in his prior career. The numbers are the numbers. And if you have right on so the Boston series, like we saw them ride the post up, and some people hold that up as an example. This is why you can't ride it; it wears him down. It's not efficient. Um, but the other way to put it is, he did pretty well there, and they hung in that series despite this roster being a mess, right? And if you're posting up with a proper roster around you and proper guys around you and shooting and guys who can create a little bit, maybe throw an entry pass, actually, things like that, it does, I agree with you. I think there's something there. I also just think all the shoving the dirt on the 2026ers and <laughs> bury, bury them. They deserve to be buried. But like a lot of the dirt shoving, would you'd get like seven paragraphs into it, and then in paragraph eight would be like, well, we should acknowledge that Ben Simmons was out for the <laughs> right. playoffs. So it's like, that should be paragraph one. Like, they're all NBA, whatever position you want to put them at, miss the series. Like, that was right. kind of a big deal. Yes, I would, uh, I, I would agree. Yes, and listen, I'm guilty of that too, right? But yeah, 100%, 100%. Well, Jeroen Weitzman, um, tanking to the top, I, I just can't stress it enough. It's a, If you've been a fan of the NBA – in the past 10 years, you, it's a, it's a must read. And I don't use that lightly. Like it's, a, you absolutely have to read it. It's an incredible book about the weirdest, craziest, 
whateverest team <laughs> in the NBA in the past 10 years. And, and I just and I, I thought of you first yesterday when Daryl um, got hired there. So if you haven't read it, anyone listening to this, get Tanking to the Top by your own Weitzman. Go on. How do you make the most money from selling a book? Where can where can we get you the most money per copy? I think I'm a good person supposed to say go on indie bookstores, bookshop, and all these places. But man, just buy it anywhere. <laughs> I don't know. Buy it anywhere. <laughs> okay. Buy it anywhere. Tanking to the Top. Your own. Thank you for your time. Be safe. And I hope to see you in person before 2023. Thank you, Zach. All right. Let's change gears. Forget about the NBA. Any piece of entertainment that I like that has like a scintilla of basketball in it, if I like it, if I, if your piece of entertainment has basketball in it and I don't like it, you know, you'll know that because I will not invite you on my podcast. I am now inviting this person on my podcast. There is a little movie that was released on video on demand, Amazon Prime, iTunes, etc. Even I can figure out how to watch it. That means you can <laughs> called House, which is going to be a problem on this podcast. We're going to have to beep it every single time. It was shot for nothing by a college student named Cooper Reif, who has some interesting connections to the Dallas Mavericks. And he was gracious enough to come on this silly NBA podcast. Cooper, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on. Seriously, it's so awesome. So here's how I found out about the movie. Bill Simmons is my old boss. His like One of his big other higher-ups at The Ringer and the Bill Simmons Media Company is a movie nerd named Sean Fennessy. And all of a sudden, Sean Fennessy, I get all my movie recommendations from Sean. He doesn't even know this. He starts tweeting like this great little film called House and this and that. I'm like, sounds like a spouse-friendly movie. I'm going to give it a shot. Like My wife won't do any action, any violence, anything like that. Let me give it a shot. And I absolutely loved it. And I come to find out it won the top prize at the South by Southwest Film Festival, which did not happen due to the coronavirus. And and now it's out in the world. It won the top prize, man. It did. Yeah, we were very shocked. It's really crazy. We didn't think that many people were going to see it. And now because of that prize, a lot of people are seeing it. So I can tell people what it's about, but why don't you tell people what it's about and sell people, um, um, give a good sales pitch, not just what it's about, but why you think it will resonate. Um, it's about a guy having a really crappy freshman year at college. And I think a lot of people can relate to just, it's about the pain of leaving home and growing up and like being under a different ceiling for those, those first nights. I think whether we admit it or not, everyone has a lot of trouble, but it's also a really nice love story. And I think, I think it's really, really funny too. People have compared it to Days and Confused in its own way. A bunch of the Richard Linklater films. Lost in Translation is an inspiration. Of your, I guess I need to see Lost in Translation again because I was underwhelmed in the theater. Do I need to see it again? You will. So I always say that was my inspiration because I think people are like, what do you mean? But I, the way that she writes little metaphors in her very realistic, very funny dialogue is like what I love like most about movies. So I think house does have a lot of that so i always want to add that because i kind of steal a lot from like i, I actually took out uh, an elliptical scene and just put it into house for that reason just to be like i love you sofia coppola but i think like i mean the movie's also inspired by just uh funny movies like i i really hope that people laugh a lot too Oh, I laughed a lot. I, the conversation you have with your stuffed animal is the, the, <laughs> the funniest part of the movie. That's a big sales pitch for people. There's a conversation with an inanimate stuffed there's, animal. Several there's of a them. couple. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so the movie is essentially mostly over one night in college, um, or my, at least half of it is kind of that night, yeah, I feel like, yeah. in college, where a lonely, somewhat depressed college freshman played by you forms a connection with um, the RA in his dorm, who's a sophomore, who's played by an outstanding actress whose name I'm going to mispronounce, so I don't even want to try, out of courtesy to her. Dylan Galula, is that right? Yes, that's right. It's perfect. Okay. Yeah. Um, and just the connection that they make strolling around campus, having adventures, and then having disagreements, and then having passive aggressive fighting because the connection doesn't mean the same thing to one of them that it does to the other. Uh, and it was, it's just one of those movies, like if you've had the privilege of going to college and experiencing college life, which not everyone is lucky enough to have the privilege to do, it really captures in a way that um, not a lot of movies have captured for me, the, both the difficulties of college, because people arrive at college, like at wildly different points on their socialization. Some people are yeah. super confident and outgoing and like just ready for everything. Some people are like too that way and they go crazy and have some problems. And some people are like I was and like the character was where they're like a little overwhelmed 
by all the the social options before them and all the newness of it, um, but also aware of, and I think this is, you strike the good balance of this, and, and maybe you can talk about it from your own experience, both overwhelmed and aware of like the infinite possibilities that exist when you and several thousand interesting young people are all together, that every day or night is a chance for something interesting and unprecedented in your life. Yeah, it, it really is. And it's super scary in that way because uh, college was the first time where I had to make all these choices and my shyness was like an obstacle for the first time. But it really is. There are so many possibilities and so many people every night. Um, but you have to go out and you have to like put yourself in those positions and make choices to spend time with people. And for me, I was like, I was in my dorm room a lot. I wasn't talking to my stuffed wolf, but like I was in that room too often. And I, when I got out a couple of times, I had some magical nights and I think everybody does. Um, but yeah. See, I had that, I lived in New York for 17 years and there are a lot of people who are scared of New York who, you know, it's too big of, it's like people I grew up with, like, oh, I can never live in New York. And I always tell people, there's just no way to capture the feeling. And New York's not the only city like this, but like, so I wasn't really socially ready for these kind of nights in college, but in New York, I was like the feeling of I'm going out tonight and of X million of the most creative people in the world are in this city. Who right. knows who I'm going to meet? College right. is kind of like that. Yes, except they're not like brilliant people most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they're, they, you think they're brilliant because they're like you, right? Yes. right? Like it, yeah. it's a bunch of like minded people that you, everyone thinks they're interesting. Yeah. And everyone's going through the same exact thing of like, I have no idea what's happening. It's pretty absurd in that way, too. Yeah. Um, so what is the last, so the, the movie was released on demand about 10 days or two weeks ago. I watched it right away. I loved it. What is, so what is like going on in your life? You can't go out on tour to promote this movie. So what is happening? It's really hard for things to feel real because everything is happening on my computer in a room that I wish I had like mo more posters in. Like it just <laughs> doesn't, it doesn't feel like I haven't had the experience of going into another place and being like, oh my gosh, I'm getting energy from all these different uh, places. But it's, so it's felt underwhelming, but also every time that I uh, get a message or, or talk to someone about it, even if it's on the screen, it's been so nice to hear that people are watching it. Cause I didn't, I didn't uh, foresee so many people. Cause I mean, not a ton of people have seen it, but way more than I ever could have expected for a small movie like this. Um, I think one of the reasons that it, it's resonating and I liked it is because so many college movies are like romps. Like, let's yeah. have a romp. Let's just, just like <laughs> romp around campus. This is not like that. And in fact, your character in the movie, I wonder how much it mirrors you, is very earnest. And, and one of the things I liked about it is earnestness, the ability to openly express one's feelings and one's affection for other people is so often portrayed not only in movies, but in regular life as weakness, as something to be embarrassed about. And I think you, you thread the needle where it sometimes is a little needy, but for the most part, I think it makes your character appear strong. Can you explain what I'm trying to get at a little bit? Yeah, I think it's definitely needy, but I think like, it's just being honest about how needy people are. And I don't know if it, I don't know if he comes across super strong, but he comes across super open in a way that I don't think I am in my real life, but I love movies because you're, it kind of gives you the pass to be open. And I don't, a lot of movies don't take advantage of that, but I was really interested in getting in front of the camera and like being able to express things that I didn't really express my freshman year and didn't like uh, access. But this movie, I think was me trying to chip away at uh, my interior life freshman year. And uh, the character is just someone who's very close to the pain of leaving home and growing up and in a way that I wasn't in a way that, the characters in house aren't, but Alex is right there in a, and in an annoying way too. Like he's uh, a big baby, but it does shine a light on what college means and what college is for everyone, whether they're facing it or not. Well, you have, you just have these scenes where you're like, yeah, I, I got a lot of hugs from my mom yeah. and I love my family. And like, I think that's kind of cool. Like it's not, like the characters, like, I think that's kind of cool. I sh why should I be embarrassed by that? Right. I, and I, I agree with that. So like I, my mom's a psychologist, so I grew up thinking feelings were super cool. So I, so I do uh, subscribe to that, but, um, but 
in terms of really being vulnerable in my real life, I think I wish I was more vulnerable and I was really excited to act in a movie and just kind of let it all out. And you also, so we've all been at this point where you have this, this night with this woman, then the next day you are your character, but, but, but like, yeah, you do embarrassing like Instagram messages and all of this and like send her a million texts and which is all bad moves, right? All, like, bad. all bad moves. People were screaming at the screen when I saw it in the theater for the first time. There's like, don't you dare. But I, I, I didn't even realize how visceral it was going to be for people watching, but people got so upset watching that part. But what's interesting to me about it is it didn't come across as pathetically to me as maybe it did to those people because your character is like, you have this wonderful night with this woman and then she sort of tunes you out and rebels away from it and, and plays games. And your character is just like, I thought we had fun. Like, can't we just keep having fun? And that's what I mean by like the earnestness is almost a strength. Like it's not something to be embarrassed about. It's like, I, I thought we were just kind of, this was a cool thing that happened. Yeah. I think it's a strength, but I think also, He's someone who really likes to have a safety net and spending a night with a person, you kind of are like, oh, this is my safety net now. And so the next day it's like, I have to get back to that place. And I think there's a desperation that, and he's, it happens to be with a person who's the exact opposite. And so when she wakes up, it's immediately like, how did I let you spend the night? And you want to get breakfast tacos? What are you talking about? And so, um, yeah, but I do think that, I feel the same way about Alex. I don't think that it's insane what he's saying and what he's wanting, but I do think that he lacks the awareness of uh, he's with someone who is, is closed off to those things that he's just right there for. And also people just need to uh, not be, be stuck in the way that Alex will always kind of be stuck in certain places because that's just who he is but he's meeting someone and he's connected with someone who's not that way. I just, I'm having a hard time verbalizing, but it's different than any movie I've seen about college. And I feel like if you went to college or are interested in college, you should watch it and it will resonate with you in a way that I think not a lot of movies I've, I've seen have. Uh, the dorm room in the movie, is it a real dorm room? Because it is the most, it is the most true to life, bad freshman dorm room that I have ever seen in any movie. Yeah, I'll say that, I'll say... I want people to think it's a real dorm room. So it is a real dorm room. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, let's switch gears for a second. Um, your uncle yes. is Jeff Wade, Jeff Skin yeah. Wade, who is the, I don't even know what he is. I call him the entertainer in the Dallas Mavericks three-man broadcast crew. He yeah. also is did something with the music in this movie. So I assume you are a huge Dallas Mavericks fan. I'm a huge Mavs fan, yes. Yeah, he's like the color commentator, basically. Yeah. He and Derek Harper. Yes. Um, yeah. So, and there's also a Mavs shirt that is a, a, an important mini point in this movie. Can you explain that? I wear the Time Is Now uh, 2011 Championship shirt for a really good portion of the movie, and I always thought of it as just like a really nice metaphor for the moment because there's it's actually written into a scene. Like he says, "I'm wearing a shirt that says the Time Is Now," and it's really funny for what the moment is. But so many people have been like thank you so much for shouting out the Mavs. And I'm like, it's a pleasure. I love the Mavs. So that's been really fun. But how yeah. Old, how yeah. old were you when the Mavericks won the 2011 title? Some obnoxiously young age. I was 13. Yeah. Okay, so you remember it. That's a big, that's oh, a, yeah. big, it was a, a big deal. It was the biggest deal ever. Yeah. I, I, that year is like viscerally in my head. Like I just, that, it was the best year of my life probably. <laughs> so you chose that shirt very carefully. You, you, oh, the, yeah. Oh, yeah. And like, I mean, that was like the year of bar mitzvahs, too. So uh, the Mavs winning bar mitzvahs, it was a, uh, yeah, it was an emotional year. <laughs> have you have you ever met Dirk? Uh, I think in passing, like Jeff was like, hey, it's, it, dude, I would love to meet Dirk, though. I love Dirk so much. I, I also just like love Kid and like I was a huge, huge Nash fan. I still am. I think your next movie... Like you can, you can get a cameo somehow from another Maverick, from a Maverick. I think a cameo is possible. Like Mike, remember that scene? I think it's Finley, Nash, and Dirk are like in the locker room and they ask him for a signature. I've always thought about that scene. I could, I could write that in somehow. Just have uh, all, all three of them together. Uh, so 
what what's are you are you obsessively following how many people are watching the movie? Do you have already a project in mind for what's next? Like what yeah, is life, life is rolling now? It's rolling. I'm trying to just focus on the new projects, but I it's really hard not to read everything that comes out about the movie because I it's my first time. I feel very controlling about I feel the need to like tell people this movie was made for nothing. Like it's 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 awesome that it that's watchable. And I think when people win awards you go into those movies with like the goggles of, all right, let's see what this is about. And I really want people to be, um, oh my gosh, this small movie is making me feel things. And that's awesome. As opposed to this isn't that good or something like that. Well, I think the reception has been. Yeah, it really has. Yeah. Um, Can you give me a ballpark? How much was it shot for? Yeah, it was shot for like less than this movie called Tiny Furniture that one South by Southwest a uh, couple years ago. It was the Lena Dunham movie. So it, it's like, a, it, it's a, it was a small, small movie and we didn't have good food and we didn't have like certain people on the set were not being paid. Are you was, just like rolling up in public and shooting stuff, right? Oh yeah, no, no permits, just like stealing all these locations. Yeah, and making, and like worried that cops are gonna come in, like only doing like two takes for things. It was, uh, yeah, so that's what I mean, it was just, the fact that some scenes are so, uh, I think, are so good is just, we were so excited. One of the things that 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 was interesting when I first learned about the movie is you you hear these stories like, oh, so-and-so is an unknown. And then you do your research. You're like, no, they've been in like five or six movies before. You just didn't know who they were. Like they wrote, they were a co-writer on this movie. You just didn't realize that you are like a total like there's nothing else on the IMDb page, really. Right. This is like a first out of nowhere thing. That strikes me as, I mean, I'm not an expert in the entertainment industry, but like that seems crazy to me. And obviously the Duplass brothers, we can talk about that a little bit, were, were critical in making this happen, right? But that's like, you. there's nothing else there. This is the first thing. Yeah, it really is the first thing because I, I didn't have a, a friend in the business. So I made a first like 50 minute thing with literally two people and zero dollars and I'm like booming like recording sound while I'm acting in a scene with my two best friends who are not filmmakers or actors but we put that on YouTube and then I tweeted that link and said bet you won't click on this link and then email me after to Jay Duplass of the Duplass brothers and then he we met and he was like I think I can help you make this into something bigger so that little movie turned into house and basically his name is the reason why we got certain people to, to show up to the sets who were somewhat professional, who were professional. They are. Professional. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, you know, I, I, I keep Googling it every day, seeing like what's, what's the buzz is and all this. And it's good, but you can tell also that like the pandemic is taking a toll on everything, right? Like it's yes, not, yeah. it's not an avalanche yet. And I want it to be an avalanche. And I don't I want it to be too an much, avalanche too. Yeah. I don't want to say too much more about it, but it's, it's a college movie, the likes of which I have not really seen before. And my wife and I both loved it. So I really wanted to have you on and, Thank you so uh, much. and just basically to pump it up. But um, are you excited about the Mavs? You like if you embrace Luca mania? I am in love with Luca. I wish he didn't complain as much, but I'm in love with Luca. He's the, he's the best. No, interesting. You take issue with his referee, his complaints to the referees. I think it'll get better, right? Maybe he'll hear this and like slow it down because I, because he's really exceptional. Like he's just the man. And I and I think he knows he's the man. Well, there's no question about that. I think Luke is a future MVP. Porzingis is a really good supporting player, and there's but, a lot. But, there's a lot to work with. And not just an MVP, but he's a winner in a way that uh, those players with that talent don't have that winning DNA. And he really, really has it. And that's why I really think that we're going to win a championship. Not and not pretty soon. I feel like. Am I wrong? Uh, the West is tough. The West is tough. You, you need some. He needs a little help to win, win a championship. Is a high bar. Anyway, I don't want to keep it. You're busy promoting this movie. People should see House. A, any other way? The Amazon Prime, iTunes, any Voodoo, on demand, anything Voodoo, on demand. Yeah, yeah. It's ninety minutes. It's it's. I actually wanted it to be longer, and I don't want to say anymore because I don't want to give away anything about how it ends. But I wanted it. To, I I could have used. I wanted like twenty more minutes. Me too. There's a cut where it is twenty min- more minutes, but we it's it's too long for certain people. It's a it's a really nice movie. It's really fun. It's easy to watch. Uh, Cooper Rife, thank you for coming on. I hope if we get more people to watch your movie because it, it's like I said, it's it's. I haven't seen anything quite like it before. Thank you so much for having me on. It really it means a lot. 
Just remember this when you get big, okay? Just re- that's all I'm saying. Just remember when you get big, okay? The low post podcast will still exist, piddling along in the NBA world. Just remember. I'll remember for sure. 